two years, a little less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like a, like a lot of poker people, it was, uh, I wasn't sure what to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you play for so long and then. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, just it took me um, a while and I was lucky enough to meet some of these guys. Um, and JJ, who you're going to meet soon. Kind of yep. took me Hello. Hey, JJ, how are you? Good, how are you? Nice to meet you, Jared. Yeah, you too. Yeah, there's a lot of guys that have moved over from uh, from poker to trading. And um, I know a bunch of institutional firms. Um, you know, there's one actually I heard about who they actually like, it's not even necessarily just like the decision making aspect of poker, but they as a as a group play poker. So they they actually had as kind of part of their um, uh, interview process, like they would play, you know, they'd have like um, all the applicants play like a, a single table tournament. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, guy, the guy who won ended up getting the job. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, you know, I always talk to like the traders. I, I feel, <clears throat> you know, especially transition over. And I know you work with both traders and poker players. Mm -hmm. uh, poker prepares you so well. Um, extreme. I mean, if, really for all areas of life, uh, and I, I'm sure you would agree um, it, it, as well, just, just the, the, the analytic thinking that I think a lot of times is probably missing from a lot of people who talk about trading, or at least the people I see uh, who talk about trading. I don't know if you've had similar experiences. I mean, I, I honestly, it's like all walks of life. I mean, I, I, I feel like I've gotten better as a golfer and my work with golfers has gotten a lot better because, you know, just the understanding of variance, um, and the ability to kind of separate short-term results is just such a, a critical skill that poker kind of drills into you uh, or it kills you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, JJ, what's, what's up, man? How's it going? Good, good, good. I've been in the industry since 93 and I've, I've only played poker. I think, well, I've played strip poker a couple of times with some Manini <laughs> girls back in the 90s, but that was pretty much my only experience. But one thing I do notice is that Ray, when he came over from poker, was he didn't have a problem with risk management and, and how, to, uh, how, to, how to actually respect his capital, which is the, uh, one of the biggest problems I find with retail traders is they don't respect their trading capital. Um, and that's, that's why they blow up accounts. So, yeah. I mean, it's easy too. I mean, I've, I've worked yeah. with lots of poker players who have blown up their accounts and I had a guy who um, basically grinded for an entire year and bet his entire net worth on Hillary to win the election. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. It's, it takes all kinds, man. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. It's just, uh, you know, like you see people just betting the whole farm on one trade and you're like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, and, and sometimes, yeah. and sometimes they do it like very consciously. Sometimes it's just, uh, you know, emotionally hijacked and don't really yeah. quote unquote have like a choice. Um, exactly. Last month uh, I saw an example of tilt, which I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ray talked about it. Uh, he introduced me to that concept when we first met, you know, where people just, after a certain point, they just don't care and they just go crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'd never seen that happen with someone and I experienced it firsthand with uh, somebody I was working with. And I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. Very, uh, very well, and, I think, and, uh, and Jared, I think, I think you talked about it in one of your books. I, I think it was, it was you, uh, like the, the, the concept of like the max pain threshold. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that was you, but like, like where the, you can't feel any more pain after a certain amount of loss. Yeah, I mean, so I talk about it, not with that, that verbiage. So like, I would right. call that, you know, either desperation tilt or just desperation. Mm -hmm. um, and it effectively kind of turns into the fuckets. Yeah. Um, right. Where yeah. you just, you, the, the odds of success are so low that you're willing to just sort of throw in, you know, the remainder of your account balance because the pain of the loss is not going to feel much worse. And so you're basically just going to kind of gain, like you kind of have all, everything to gain in that moment, in that moment, right? Obviously, you know, yeah. hindsight is cleaner and you're like, man, I would, I would have loved that extra, you know, thousand bucks, 5,000 bucks, you know, whatever it was, because obviously yeah. it's still capital, but you know, the opportunity to get yourself out of hell and basically like buy a, lot, a lottery ticket that might get you out of there is, is pretty attractive when, when you're feeling that much pain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think like JJ, the guy we're going to talk to tomorrow, um, the rogue trader for you guys who've seen the movie, uh, Nick Leeson, uh, I think that's exactly what happened to him. They started off with just a 20 K loss, which for the type of money they're dealing with is nothing. And yeah. Compounded it to a $1.5 billion loss. 
blowing up England's biggest, like one of England's oldest bank, <laughs> yeah. Finan- financed the Louisiana yeah. Purchase. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they just you know disappeared. I, I remember the, watching that in real time. Yeah, um, you know, and I was, and, and and I was telling Ray, I said there were a couple of times too because back in those days, we had paper tickets. You didn't enter, you know, your trades on a computer. So if you had bad trades, you would hide those trading tickets, um, you know, until settlement. And, and back in those days, we had longer settlements. So you could, you know, hide stuff until it, you know, until it was due. But uh, I, I remember being in that situation. I remember what, uh, going, you know what? I'm not going to Nick Leeson this, man. I'm just going to, I'm mm-hmm. going to tell the boss that we took this loss, you know, because yeah. yeah, I've seen this, I've seen this on TV. It's not going to get any better. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> yeah, wise wise move well uh, thank like, everyone yeah, for, we'll take the hit yeah yeah i just want to thank everyone for uh joining us thank you jared for joining us jared you want to uh introduce yourself to the audience yeah sure um hey everybody um so uh we kind of started off you, you may have heard a little bit of me talking about my poker experience my golf experience but um, i got into this field um as a competitive golfer wanting to play professionally um you know i was a three-time all-american in college won nine tournaments but when I would go to play in big national events, like trying to qualify for the U S open, um, I just sort of found myself, uh, basically in uncertain terms choking, um, and, you know, missing short putts, which was, you know, where my technical weakness was, uh, at the time. And, you know, at the end of the day, I was not going to just like try to become a pro. So I decided to, um, fill a gap in the marketplace that I, I thought was being underserved because the sports psychology, golf psychology material at the time really wasn't helping to solve that issue right it helped me get better in general but when you know uh the 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 putts on the line uh for basically my future um i I couldn't perform so i I went and got a master's degree in counseling psychology a license 3200 hours of supervised practice to get licensed as a therapist never with the the intent to practice but i wanted to learn the skills of, of problem solving at a deeper level that that therapists um have and so Basically, I combined therapy and sports psychology and created this program that kind of deals on these performance flaws. And we're going to get into this in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, and so I, I basically, after I got my license, quit my job, moved out to Arizona, started working with golfers and built up a roster of clients. And, you know, I mean, I was young and, you know, kind of starting to build, uh, build up a roster. And, but I ended up meeting a, a poker player. Um, who used to be a professional golfer and we kind of hit it off and he was having some big tilt issues as we were talking about literally breaking his monitor, ripping his desktop computer out of the, out of the wall and smashing it in the corner. Um, and, and this was all because he was trying to play a shit ton of poker in one year um, to earn this sort of big bonus of hundred K at the end of the year, he was making around 20 to $30,000 a month. So hundred K was a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in the four months after he and I started working together, he made a total of 600 grand. Um, now, obviously there's a little bit of good luck in there, but the biggest change was his volume almost tripled because he wasn't tilting as much. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there's some people on the call right now who, you know, are not able to trade as much as they want either because they've hit their stop loss for the day, uh, or because they understand that they are too emotionally compromised and are smart enough to walk away. But, you know, obviously you're limiting your opportunity when you're not in front of the, the terminal. So, uh, anyway, so he and I kind of hit it off and I, made my entry into poker and there was nobody doing what I do. Uh, and it was sort of what kind of wide open runway to kind of make it. Um, and so I, I wrote two poker books and those poker books ended up getting picked up by some traders back in 2013 and started building up a, cro- a roster of, of, uh, of, of trading clients. And then I uh, started working with some institutional firms, you know, 40, 50 traders on a desk and kind of going in and doing some, uh, some work with them. Um, and, uh, for four years, I was the head of sports psychology for Team Liquid, the largest esport organization in the world. Um, so I, I say sort of the poker trading esport thing in part because um, basically I was a perf- you know competitive golfer trying to play at a high level, um, and I basically learned three different markets and have proven that my system applies in all four domains. Um, elsewhere in- included, I've worked with a radiologist, a lawyer, um, you know, a kind of handful of other people. But the point is that. The system works because it's based off of some very basic principles for how the mind operates, how the emotional system works. You know, and when I look at the questions that were submitted, um, there is just some basic fundamental understandings that are missing. And so even just the phrasing of your questions, the things that you're asking for, 
I think are really, um, you know, kind of based off of a perspective that is very common, not just in trading, but in poker, in golf, in esports, where we think that we're just sort of like looking for this advice that's going to help us kind of get over the hump. And for some of you, that's, that's probably true, right? If you don't have, you know, re very recurring, you know, uh, big problems that are significantly, you know, either costing you or that you're unable to kind of get over, you know, advice sometimes can make a difference. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. And if I look at the other trading books that are out there, a lot of them are very good. I mean, trading in the zone is a, is a great book. There's, you know, others like it. Um, but what the difference is between my work is that it's not based on advice. We're not like stock picking in a sense, right? We're not looking for the right, um, you know, idea to generate profit. We're looking at a system, which is very much like what you guys have as traders. And, and when you have a system for understanding how the mind works, you have a system for understanding how the emotional system works, how these problems emerge, you have the basis to actually solve your own issues and to be able to do that, uh, you know, for the entirety of your career. Uh, you know, you can't solve the mental game. And so as a result of that, you need to kind of learn how to fish. You need to learn how to be able to problem solve. And so I'm going to talk about just a couple kind of high level points that are critical that you understand. And once you understand them, then I think we can start to get into the questions that you've asked um, and kind of take it where, wherever you guys want to run with it. But if you don't have that stuff, then we're going to be kind of swimming upstream uh, for the entirety of this time, because you know, you're going to be looking for me to give you a piece of advice that's going to like instantly fix your problems. And that's just does not how it works. Um, you can't get skilled in the mental game, uh, you know, as quickly as picking up a piece of advice. So the first principle that, that needs to be understood and, you know, well enough that, you know, it should be sort of, you know, figuratively tattooed to the inside of your brain um, is that um, emo the emotional system has the power to shut down higher brain function. And when I mean by higher brain function, I mean thinking, right? If you have a voice, you know, thoughts in your head, right? That's, that's called working memory that exists in the sort of, the, in that um, higher brain function area, decision-making, planning, um, and of course, emotional control. So the part of the brain responsible for emotional control is shut down or compromised by intense emotions. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's the brain's way of fucking us basically. Okay. And, and this fundamental principle cannot be changed. Some of you may have heard of this as the fight or flight mechanism. Okay. That, that term, you know, is a little bit, you know, not specific enough for me, right? When we look at this, we're just talking about the escalation of emotion rises to a certain point. At that point, you proportionally start to lose access to your ability to think, plan, make decisions, and what happens in that space, right? So it's not like you, things are so bad, right? You're not in a blind rage. You're not in a blind panic. You still have the ability to think and be aware of what's going on. But here is the, here's the real problem. And I know this from the questions that have already been asked. When you're in this sort of middle zone where your emotions have actually kind of compromised you, but you don't really know it, you actually are very aware of what you ought to be doing, but you're not able to do it. You can't pull the trigger. You can't oh, jump that, in. That's happened many times. Then. Yeah, no, I mean, it happens to all of us, right? And, 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 and the thing you have to understand is the reason is because your emotional system has compromised your ability to think clearly. If you, if you were in your right mind, you'd, you'd have no friction, you know, in, in terms of uh, what you're, the decisions that you're making and, and what you're actually executing in terms of your trades. It is that emotion that has paralyzed that part of your brain and it makes you feel like you're still in control when you're not. And, and I'm telling you, it is a massive problem. So here's what we have to do. You have to begin mapping and detailing out the escalation of emotion. Um, can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we were talking about Tilt. So I'm just going to share a document um, that's actually available on the website. If you go to resources under worksheets, you'll see it. Any, you guys can go on there now um, and download this for yourself. Um, Okay, this yeah, will stop sorry. your this will stop your screen sharing. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so just give me a thumbs up when you guys can see this, or I guess say thumbs up because I can't I can't see you anyway. So yeah, yeah, I don't I don't I don't see it. I I, I try to give you permission. I don't know if uh, Steve because I know Steve's screen sharing it. Oh, there we go. Good, it's good, Jerry. 
You can say, okay. Yep. All right, so this is basically an anger profile. We're just gonna ignore this top part here. Um, and we're gonna look at the anger level and the technical changes. This, these two boxes are one of the most important things that you can do, okay? And so when I say like mapping or detailing out your problems, um, basically what we're looking at are the thoughts, the emotions, the things you say out loud, like the behaviors, which would include, you know, some of the trading mistakes that you make, uh, the actions that you take, uh, some of the physical symptoms, right? Like if you're, you know, your hand gets tense on, on, on the mouse, you maybe pound your desk, um, you can actually feel heat in your head. Uh, what you're looking to do is detail out, you know, at level one, the most basic minor level of frustration or irritation that you're experiencing, right? And, and if you can do that, then maybe you can, you know, also detail out, like, what is it like just before your mind starts to get compromised at level four or five? And then if you can do that, then obviously you can map what the hell is going on at level seven through 10, where things get really bad. But what you're looking to do again is, is detail out all of those thoughts, emotions, things you say, behaviors, like all of it at each of these increasing levels. And then you do the same thing from a, a pure technical side, right? Describe your decision-making process, describe your, your perception of the market or the opportunities or how current positions may, may interact. Um, basically, you know, what are your common kind of trading mistakes and uh, the things that you're, you're having trouble with? Um, you kind of put these two things together and, you know, let's just say for argument's sake that at level five, right, that is the point where your emotions have now shut down higher brain function to a point where it's going to be very difficult for you to execute. If you can identify it at level one or level two or level three, that is when you need to start taking control. That is when you need to start working to address the anger, the fear, the greed, whatever we're talking about. If you do it then, you actually have full functionality of your mind and you have the ability to actually make some progress. If you don't, then you're going to be in the spot that many of you have been in for a long time, which is swimming upstream, trying to, one, trying to figure out what the hell to do. Okay. So now this is not the complete solution, but this is the beginning of the system, right? It's understanding first and foremost, that there's an escalating problem that you need to get a handle of quickly. Um, and then the second piece, which we haven't gotten to yet is that we're actually going to look at emotion. I'm going to stop sharing this now. Um, we're actually going to look at emotion um, being a signal, right? Again, kind of a departure for how many people think about it, that you think that anger is the problem. You think that greed is the problem or overconfidence. But those that, that's just a, a signal of the underlying performance flaws, like I mentioned uh, a bit earlier in terms of how I developed my program. Um, and, and so when you start looking at emotions as the symptom, then it automatically makes you curious as to what the hell is going on. And the language that you use, the things that you say, the things that piss you off, or the things that make you, you know, fearful, they become, you know, where you're going to be really curious, and starting to try to figure out what you're going to do. And that's really what what my book is designed for, right, the mental game of trading, right, it kind of takes you through this mapping process, it takes you through the dissection process to identify those underlying performance flaws. Um, and just to give you a couple examples, because I'm, I'm sure, you know, many of you are wondering what the hell I'm talking about here. Um, but there's effectively like around, you know, 25 to 30 of them in the book that I talk about. Uh, they include things like um, high expectations, um, illusions of control, black and white thinking, um, illusions of emotional control. I um, had a new client today, this was a big problem, right? So many of you think, right, in that compromised state where you know what you should be doing, but you can't do it, you think that you should be in control, right? That's an illusion, right? We just talked about how the emotional system has the power to, 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 to shut down your ability to control it. So if you don't know that, you're going to falsely assume that you can have control when you can't. Um, you know, uh, having a weak process, uh, there's a story in the book that uh, I talk about with a very experienced trader, 15-year trader, who wasn't able to capitalize on these big opportunities when he'd have this, you know, kind of gut instinct that, um, you know, there's a, a lot of money to make it make in this position. Um, he wasn't trusting his intuition. And the reason was because in that moment, he was fearful of being wrong, not because he hated being wrong, or he didn't, didn't like mistakes. It was because his process wasn't that well known to him, right? In every other situation, he could tell you in 30 seconds why he's a good trader, why he's made a lot of money in his career. In that moment, when the big opportunity was at play, he couldn't do it. It's like his mind went fuzzy. So we spent time actually detailing out what made him a skilled trader. He wrote out his, not just his plan, 
but like what he was actually going to do in these types of situations, how he knew his intuition was right. And all of a sudden that unlocked his ability to, to do it. It wasn't that complicated, but there was a weakness in his process that became, you know, evidence of that kind of underlying performance flaw. Um, hating, hating variance is a, is a common one. Uh, wishing and hoping would be uh, other two. So as we kind of get into some of these questions, I'll help you to kind of brainstorm what your underlying performance flaws are. But that's really where we're trying to operate, right? Um, you, you can't kill a weed by just, you know, chopping off the roots or chopping off the top of it or, or stepping on it, right? To kill a weed, you got to pull it up by the roots. If you're going to solve mental or emotional issues, you have to have a system designed to actually kill the roots. And when you do that, you achieve permanent resolution. The weed can't grow back. The, the freaking root system is gone. Okay. You will not experience tilt or greed or fear in the situations that you do if you have actually solved the root cause of the issue. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll never experience fear or anger again, but it means that you'll never do that again for that reason. And that means your mental game has evolved. You've grown, right? In essence, uh, you know, your best has become better and your worst has become better. Sort of true advancement or evolution in my mind. So again, that's kind of a, a broad overview of the system, but as we kind of get into these specifics, you'll sort of see how it, how it begins to work. Wow, good stuff, Jared. I mean, I feel like we could end this right now. Uh, a, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. Jared, um, it's something I was thinking about. Um, I think even myself, I ran into, I see like a lot of people might think they're above like uh, human nature or above some of these emotional pulls. Bingo. Do, do you do you find that talking to people that uh, some people think this stuff doesn't apply to them? But when I think in reality, I think none of us are above any of this. Hell, I mean, hell yeah. Uh, hell yes. And and um, hell no. I mean, right. Hell yeah. Like it is incredibly common. There's another guy uh, featured in the book. Uh, just there are 17 traders who are featured in the, in, the, in the book, by the way. There's a lot of stories about this one guy. He actually just sort of hated his own humanity in a sense, like he hated the fact that he was going to make mistakes. I mean, if you are not making mistakes, you are not trying hard enough, mm. right? You have to be pushing yourself to the point, not a failure, but to the point where you're learning. Because if you're not making mistakes, it means you, you're, you're not learning. Um, it means you're just applying everything that you've already, or already learned. So, so yeah, there, it's, it's very common to think that this stuff doesn't apply. But the reality is that whether we're talking about big issues or small issues, it's fundamentally impossible to not have weaknesses mentally or emotionally, right? When I work with institutional traders, they have weaknesses. Now those weaknesses are pretty minor. We're doing some like, you know, fine tooth kind of surgical style, like understandings of, of where their, let's say overconfidence is, is coming from because they just had the best year of their entire career in 2020. And now the market's different. Uh, it's not to say that there's not still a lot of opportunity, but, you know, they're probably going to make 4X less than they did last year. And being able to kind of recalibrate to that, being able to, you know, understand that, you know, their yeah. systems may change. So, yeah, it's it's very common. Yeah, that's a, that's definitely like the, that last point. I, I find that the tough part for me, right, is like knowing that, okay, hey, maybe the market's not presenting as much opportunity and not trying to force, you know, like force your will on the market. Uh, it could be a tough thing. So, Jerry, you want to uh, you want me to uh, jump into the questions? I'll read them to you. you yeah, yeah, yeah. Fire away. Yeah. All right. All right. Awesome. All right. So, first question we got here. Uh, I would like to ask for his thoughts on the mental aspect of letting our winners run for greater profits. We always cut our losses quickly, but too many times we cut the winners even quicker. Yeah. So now we're using the system here. Okay. So I can't answer this question emphatically and say I can tell you exactly what that underlying flaw is. But what I can say is that typically, if you start asking the why question in those moments, or even afterwards, like, why is it that you're uh, locking up a winner? What's the reason for it, right? And that's, that's the beginnings of starting to understand uh, the problem. So what's a common reason? I mean, one is either a fear of losing or a hatred of losing. Um, you know, th those are, are pretty reasonable uh, answers to it. Um, it's especially true if you've kind of come out of a drawdown and you're, you know, kind of more likely to, um, in some respects, it can be a need to lock up confidence. Um, you know, sometimes for, for many traders, uh, money equals confidence. Uh, you're not always going to think in those terms consciously, but when you start to kind of peel back the layers of 
you know, why it is that you're uh, going to lock up a winner is because you want to end the day green because that's going to make you feel good, you know. But if you were, you know, uh, evaluating yourself and your competency based on your execution of your sat uh, of your system or your strategy, then you know you wouldn't feel good about locking up that winner, regardless of how much money you may have made uh, because you didn't execute the plan. Um, you know, one of the things that I have many of my clients do, and I think you know, it's detailed out in the book as well, is to complete something I call an A to C game analysis, where they actually write out the differences between their A game, their B game, their C game. It's similar to the mapping I described, but kind of a different um, style of it. And, and, and so when you do this, um, you, kinda, kinda, you can begin to sort of change the, the mechanism by which you're evaluated. Right? We need feedback. It's, it's fundamental to our nature as, as a species. You can't learn without feedback. But if we're basing our feedback solely on P&L, then you know it's limited because there's a lot of short-term bias in terms of how that PL is reflected in in our execution. And so the A to C game analysis becomes your way of detailing out, like, all right, how did I perform today? Right? Did I actually execute my plan? And if I did and I lost money, you can still feel a little good about it. I'm not saying you know you're going to be fist pumping at the bar, like, yeah, I lost money today, but I did great. But you know, it, it can actually start to buffer the downside a little bit uh, and and make you feel a little bit more balanced. And on the flip side when you have a, a profitable day and you cut a bunch of winners short, you damn well not better not feel as good about that. And you, and you need to be aggressive at figuring out uh, what's going wrong and why. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay. The next question is a little bit long winded. I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, uh, surmise it here. Uh, the guy, the guy's doing well with his large account, Jared. He, I guess he has a large account. He has no problem. He's doing well in that account. Now he has a, another trading account with a different broker which is smaller and it's a disaster and he can't win for anything. He's panicking, putting trades of fear or loss. Any thoughts seems I need to get my mind in control somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so again, I'm not, I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to keep reiterating this, but I'm going to do it enough for the kind of drill it in there. Everybody's head. You got to start asking the why questions. Like what is the difference between these two accounts? We can't just, you know, surmise that it's just about the size, right? Sometimes people get a little snake bit. Right. And it feels like you're getting unlucky, like there's something fundamentally wrong, you know, with that account. Right. And so you're panicked trying to kind of force it or make it work. Well, what does that express? Right. It expresses either some, uh, you know, illusion of control. Right. When we look at injustice, um, sometimes that's that's a big component to it. Right. You, you are looking for control over variance in places that you can't have it. Right. Um, you know, superstitions are a lot like that. Um, you know, but maybe there actually is something fundamentally different in the way that you're actually trading the account, you know, because of the size. And so maybe there's a technical problem that, you know, is either, you know, was a problem and is, it, is it now? I think it's really important that we don't overestimate the importance of the mental game. And I say that purposely. I, I, there are people out there who think that trading is sometimes even 100% psychology, which is absolute garbage. Okay. It's not even 90% of trading. Okay. You know, that that number came from a Bobby Jones quote, who was one of the most famous um, amateur golfers of all time. And he said that golf was sorry. He said competitive golf was was 90 percent mental effectively. Uh, so, yeah, if you look at the PGA Tour, right, what's the differences between some of the top players? Right. It's not how good their swing is. Um, it's It tends to be, you know, the mentality. Uh, but that's not always true with trading. And I actually had a client in the, in the book who his issue was that he was actually overestimating the importance of it. And he wasn't actually working hard enough on his system and realizing, you know, where some of these leaks were, he was having a ton of hesitation at the moment, you know, where he was going to get in. And it turned out that all of the doubts and questions that he had had to do with weaknesses in his, in his comprehension of his discretionary strategy. And so he was able to actually create more system systemization there. And, and that was the answer with the fear was not based off of a performance flaw the fear was based off of the fact that he didn't have enough clarity with his system. And that may be the case uh, with this person here. Wow. Interesting. That's that definitely found some food for thought. I, I think how I kind of thought about the question, Jared, uh, at least how I related to it is like when I would jump up stakes in poker, I, I kind of look at it as this, this seems like a bankroll issue almost for okay. him, right? Or at least in terms of it, I know I'd always struggle when I would jump up stakes at first because my losses are bigger. Uh, I'm maybe a little less rolled. Maybe I'm taking a shot. And I think that like weighs on your, you know, like to what you're saying, maybe blocking my higher level brain function, perhaps. 
Yeah, and maybe it's the opposite here because he's saying he's doing fine with his large account, but the small account's the one that's struggling. So maybe there's just sort of this like, you know, um, maybe early on, because the size, it was not something that was um, overly prioritized. So maybe it was just sort of a little bored or loose with it. It's like sometimes you can just, uh, yeah, just not make great decisions because you're not as challenged uh, because yeah. of the size. And so then, then all of a sudden you start losing it at outsized rate and then you start to become panicked trying to figure out what the hell's going on. It turns out you just weren't trying hard enough. So it can kind of go both ways. I mean, if, you're, if, if, if it is sort of this, you know, challenging moving up in stakes, I think you got to look at it, you know, kind of more broadly that like, you know, when you are getting better at something, you typically are going to have like a resurgence of the mental or emotional issues that you had at lower levels, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Skill, skill can be a buffer for some of those mental and emotional problems, right? If you, if you start changing your strategy, uh, if you start uh, actually, you know, kind of moving into different markets uh, entirely, you know, sometimes you'll have, uh, actually, you know, I had a, a trader who, um, you know, was trading futures and then went to options or one that went from, you know, uh, options to futures. And, you know, it, yeah, it's still trading. And yeah, obviously there's some kind of mechanical differences but those mechanical differences can 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 make it such that because there's not as much kind of automatic decision making, then you are actually kind of more like kind of vulnerable to these mental and emotional weaknesses popping up, just because you haven't kind of established that uh, that routine or that competency yet. So the same thing happens when you move up and or or you size up. Same thing can happen when you size down or you're you know trading smaller. It's like we can be challenged in lots of different ways, and you you really need to be have a good kind of fingerprint on, on what you're going to experience and, and have a strategy for it. And then when you move up, size up, uh, you know, you, you kind of can be prepared for that stuff to show up rather than, you know, what most people do is, you know, kind of hope for the best and then they're unprepared when the best doesn't happen. If I might jump in really yeah. quickly on that guy's account, um, what are the, if he's getting stopped out a lot on the smaller account, he might be using, you know, a, uh, uh, a smaller stop in that smaller account mm -hmm. and not taking into account the price action. The other thing is when you jump from market to market, you're trading completely different order flow. So uh, it, it would be, it would, would make sense that you would have trouble uh, at first because you don't understand the order flow of the new market that you're trading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and a that's, lot of all, times that's people, all technical, right? It's not mental. A lot of times people like, I, I, I mean, the psychology part is great for people who actually understand what they're doing, but a lot of new traders don't understand what's actually going on in the business. And they think it's psychology when it's just a lack of understanding of what the hell is actually going on. That's absolutely um, right. You know, so right at, right at the beginning of the book, I make it very clear that this book and my work is by and large for traders that already have an established system and are either profitable, but not as much as they want to be, or they, they strongly believe that they would be, you know, if that not for these sort of mental and emotional problems, um, by and large, it's not for beginners. Um, however, if you are a newer trader, the way that the book could help or the way that, you know, psychology can help is mostly for you to be, be able to kind of get a hold of issues that exist outside of trading. They're the ones that are typically going to show up when you start trading. Now, sometimes, you know, just the, the environment itself, you know, exposes weaknesses that you didn't know you had. And that's common. So don't feel like that's, that's atypical. But by and large, the issues are going to be more personal because you're not good enough as a trader to know where that intersection of your psychology and your system is actually interacting. For me, I need to, I need you know my clients to put a spotlight on their biggest trading mistakes. Where are they losing money, you know, or where are they where do they feel like they're giving up opportunity if they're not able to be as focused as they want, or you know they're not in the zone as often. But by and large, we're looking at the mistakes and the recurring ones. That becomes your spotlight to then start figuring out you know, what emotions are causing it, what emotions are influencing you? Uh, why is it occurring? If you don't have a strong enough system uh, or strong enough strategy to do that, it gets really fuzzy really quickly. Yeah, sure does. Sure does. All right. Next question here. Um, try, the, the guy's asking, how does he evaluate his trades in a manner that will reveal the issues um, that he is facing, either fear of being wrong, misreading the market, uh, instead of becoming feel fearful of the next trade or putting too much on trade and risking too much if successful. I don't, I don't know if that made sense to you, Jared. Um, well, I, I guess from the beginning of the question of like, you know, viewing each trade as a single event and not 
like kind of compounding as, you know, basically we're talking about like, how do you, how do you kind of reset yourself? Um, how do you not kind of look um, kind of too, I, so I, I, you know, the trouble is like, you're trying to view each trade as a single event, but at the same time that that can actually be somewhat problematic because um, you know, every single event may or may not be a perfect representation of your skill, right? That's, that's the whole point here with, with variance in the short term. Um, so uh, to me, I think what we're talking about is how can you not allow the emotion that may occur within each trade to carry over and build up over time, right? So it's, you lose a trade, you win a trade, you know, you want to try to be, you know, kind of reset for the next one as, as best you can. And, and the easiest way to begin doing that is, is kind of what I've outlined already, right? You, you got to understand why that emotion is even there to begin with. If you don't understand that, then, you know, your ability to, to reset yourself gets significantly compromised. Now, one of the things you can do right now, like all of you can do this, is just keep a notepad next to you, you know, print out one of the profiles that I mentioned, um, or just have a blank piece of paper with, you know, those points I mentioned, right? Thoughts, emotions, what are the triggers? What's the situation where this is occurring? What are the things you're saying out loud? Or, uh, you know, how, how, how might you describe kind of the physical sense or the, the actions that you're taking? So after a trade where you lose or you win, you can start to sense that there's something emotionally off, just write it down. I mean, you have time, write down what's going on. Um, that will give you a, you know, real time data that's going to be important in the future as you kind of build up the patterning of what's occurring. But for some traders, actually just the act of doing that can help to release a little bit of the emotion um, so that it can help to reset you uh, in the short term as you're building that up. All right, next question. How do I drown out the noise and not have paralysis by analysis? What is this cause? What is causing this in me as I know it, but cannot overcome it? Yeah, so a lot of this is fear, right? So paralysis by analysis basically is driven by fear. Fear drives the mind into overdrive and that thinking that's, that's just like kind of moving at warp speed um, is designed to try to find an answer to what's going on. Like, and the, and the answer is how the hell can I get in or how, like, how the hell can I actually make a decision that I can feel good about? Uh, and so again, you have to start to understand what's driving the fear. Is it a fear of failure? Are you fearful of making mistakes? You know, for some traders, they've got this beaten dog syndrome where, um, fear comes as a byproduct of having beaten the shit out of themselves over the years, right? The, the self-criticism and the negativity and the tilt that comes from losses, right? You, you, you experience fear before you get in the trade uh, because you're fearful of, of the rage that's going to occur if you lose or make a mistake. Um, so again, we're trying to look for what it is that you're fearful of and why. Um, and that's how you can begin kind of unwinding that, that paralysis. But, but again, I think it's an, it's an important kind of new concept, um, not new in general, but new to you guys, to, to think about thinking as having functionality, right? When you're, when you're thinking is moving at warp speed, um, you're just searching for an answer. And sometimes the best thing you can do is actually just write things out in that moment because the mind has a limited capacity to kind of find those answers. And when you mm -hmm. start to externalize it, it actually you know, kind of solves for the math problem that is that limitation, right? Like imagine uh, you were trying to complete a puzzle, let's say like a thousand piece puzzle, but you could only look at three pieces at one time or five pieces at one time, right? It would take you forever. But when you write things down, you actually are able to effectively like look at more pieces because you're offloading the responsibility of the thinking part of the brain to have to hold all that information, right? To, to a piece of paper. And, and then you can actually look at it. it, it it's a very simple way to begin to start to uh, evaluate the quality of your thinking in, in more objective terms. That's really good. Uh, if I can jump in, just sorry, once again, uh, if it's a newer trader, you might be looking at too many things at the same time, trying to correlate markets, things like that. I've had a ton of those, those questions this week. Focus on the price action in what you're trading and don't look at anything else. Focus, 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 focus. That will also help. Absolutely. All right, Jared, if I'm having a solid week of trading, I'll often chill and take Friday off to protect my wins so I have a good weekend. But if I am trading bad all week, I will trade on Friday. Seems like I got this backwards. Any advice? Yeah, I think the first thing you got to do is look at your goals. Um, it seems like an obvious thing that your goal is to make money, um, but it's clear that you have a goal of having a good weekend, <laughs> right? And so 
you know, a lot of times we have these sort of conflicting goals or motives that kind of operate in the background that you need to be aware of. And, and so I, I'd say the first thing that you want to look at here is, is what exactly um, are, are you trying to accomplish, right? Um, I mean, I think in the near term, you know, that, that may not be the thing that automatically kind of changes your mentality, but I think you want to, you want to be kind of using that, that A to C game analysis that I mentioned before and changing kind of how you grade yourself on Fridays. Um, you know, change how you grade yourself on the weekend, change what you want to feel at the end of the week. You know, do you want to feel accomplished like you were, you know, performing at your best, you know, more often, um, you know, or do you want to make money? I mean, yes, you want both, but, you know, the more money part is not entirely in your control every week. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the short term, I would just recognize that Fridays are going to be harder. Maybe you actually have a slightly different game plan in terms of maybe only taking like A plus uh, setups or positions or, or trades um, and, and, you know, just kind of lock down, you know, uh, something that's better than where you were before. Um, th this idea of sucking less is actually like a really important kind of mental shift that many of you need to make. Um, sometimes being our best is not attainable. And for, for this person right now, Fridays, you know, are probably not going to be your best for a little while right? um, either way. So, so just trying to suck less. Maybe it's you, you trade for an hour and again, only take those A plus setups. Something that you can kind of build on uh, can be, you know, a, a great way to start. And, and that, that principle of sucking less, you know, doesn't just apply here. It applies to lots of different situations. I constantly say I will not move my stops yet. I find I continue to do so. Yeah, I mean, so uh, this one just comes down to intelligence. Um, I mean, this person is just clearly not, no, I'm kidding. Um, no. <laughs> um, no, I mean, this is, this goes right back to what I was saying earlier, right? Like the emotional system has the power to make you feel like you're still in control and yet you're not right. So you can say it all you want, right? You can say today's a new day. I'm, you know, I've moved past my problem, but the reality is you don't have a fucking clue what's actually causing you to move those stops. Right. And, and that's nothing to feel ashamed about. It's nothing to feel bad about. I mean, most of the people that I work with don't have a fucking clue what they're at. Right. And, <laughs> and, and that's, it's, it's, this, this shit's hard, man. I've spent 20 years developing this system. Right. I didn't know this when I was trying to play professionally or wanting, you know, wanting to play at a high level. Shit. If I, if I knew what I knew now, maybe I would be right. I mean, hindsight's, uh, you know, obviously uh, easier to, you know, paint in fantasy like ways. Yeah. Um, but the reality is you just have to start asking that question. Why am I doing this? Right. And, and, and be, and have, have an element of curiosity. It's not because you're stupid. It's not because you're dumb. It's not because you're willful. It's not because you want to lose. Right. There's a reason for it. And if you figure out what that is, you're asking the right questions and you're going to start opening your mind. It's, 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 it's honestly crazy. You know, I'll be, I'll, the number of times this has happened in a session with a client where you know, they kind of come in and they're, they're very kind of firm in their thinking, like, man, it just, it doesn't make any sense why I do this. Like, I'm such a freaking idiot. Like, okay, well, it's not about intelligence. Okay. There's a reason for it. We just don't understand the reason for it. I mean, when you think something is irrational or illogical, it's not, you know, none of you are uh, in, a, in a freaking in, insane asylum, right? These are <laughs> our problems that are not that complicated. You're just not solving them in the right way. Okay. So if it's irrational, illogical, you feel like you're dumb, doesn't feel like there's any reason for it. It just means you don't know the reason yet. <laughs> it's, a, it's just that simple. So you just have to start asking that question. And when I start asking them that those why questions, all right, well, you know, tell me, tell me why you think, you know, you, you keep moving your stops. It's like, well, I don't want to lose. I, I don't want this position to stop me out. I've been stopped out a bunch of times in a row. You know, I, I feel like I've gotten a, a really unlucky. It's like, okay that's different, right? You can see the hamster wheel in their mind is actually turning differently. Okay. Information that has, has been there, but wasn't accessed starts to come out. And so, yeah. So in this particular prop, if, if this person is dealing with injustice, we got to figure out why uh, a very common one um, is something called prospect theory. And if you, any of you know, Daniel Kahneman's work, you know, the guy that wrote thinking fast or slow prospect theory basically says, uh, losing hurts more than winning feels good. Okay. So yeah, you're going to, you're going to move your stop to avoid a loss because it's going to hurt more and, and it's going to hurt more 
you know, then if you kept the stop where it is and it stopped you out, but then you actually had the capital to go into a more profitable trade in the future <laughs> because you didn't hit your daily stop loss and actually could take advantage of opportunities that were going to turn out well. The, the benefit of that, the benefit of the win is, is you know, uh, sometimes orders of magnitude less emotionally impactful than the, the severity of the loss. So you'll do a lot more to avoid the loss than you will to do the right things to seek the win. And Jared, what would you say about um, people approaching, you know, whatever problem it is that, you know, like we're talking about whether it's moving stops uh, in a manner that's maybe like more relaxed in a, in a, like a buoyant light manner, as opposed to really stressing over the issue. And like, like you can almost be too rigid at a point, right? Like, like too, like stressed or too forceful with trying to correct the mistake. I'm sorry. Say, say, can you say it like reframe it? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, uh, I find like with people, right. Like, so let's say I'm trying to correct something. Maybe it's me moving my stops. Um, and people being really, uh, you know, st stressing over it, uh, causing more stress to themselves as opposed to like maybe approaching it in, in a calm or relaxed, a logical fashion. Uh, did you ever find that with people who are like almost like almost like overstress about their issues? Y yes. But, but we, we, again, still have to treat that as the symptom. Right. That, that's not the problem. I mean, there's a reason that they're overly stressed about it. We have to figure out what that is. I mean, it could be, you know, this like impending feeling of doom, like you're running out of time because, you know, you've been working at this for two years and you're not making, you know, what feels like real progress because you're not making money yet. You're not actually able to become, you know, do this full time. And so, yeah, you're freaking stressed about it because your your entire two years of work is on the line, your entire future, what you, you know, envisioned when you became a trader is on the line. So, you know, I, I, again, I think we, we tend to sort of treat, you know, these emotional issues as the problem and they're not right. They're, they're just the symptom. They're just the signal. And it's our job to understand what the signal is saying. And, and that's why I say like, you know, you guys are really good at doing this for price action and for volume and volatility and like understanding where the opportunities are in the market, right? You use these signals all the time to tell you when there's opportunity. And so what I've done with this system, what's you know in the book and what I do with my clients is we read the tea leaves, the stuff that you're writing down in your profile, right? That is the beginnings of you trying to understand where the opportunities lie. And, and the opportunity in the mental game is to isolate these flaws because if you isolate them, it is so much easier to actually correct it. And then, yeah, you're automatically not going to be as stressed. Like the stress is never going to go to zero, okay? Right. If you talk to any professional athlete, right, when they are competing, they're they are stressed. Like it's not like relaxing. You know, I, I know there's a question coming up about this, and we may not may not get to it. So I'm just going to jump to it now about transitioning from the sim to the live market. Okay, the sim is not the same as the live market. It never will be for one simple reason, because you are different. Okay, when you're practicing basketball or golf or whatever, right even if you're playing for money matches, even if you're playing for, for pride, right? It's still not the same when your goals are on the line, when your confidence is on the line, when your future is on the line, when, when the things that you put so much time and effort into are on the line, it is more emotional. It is more stressful. Thinking that those two environments are the same is, is actually a performance flaw. <laughs> okay. You're basically equating practice and, 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 and real competition as being the same things. They're fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in general, right, like trading is stressful. It's not relaxing. So that means that there's going to be more of this, this volatility that exists. And we can take out some of it by understanding the flaws that are producing it. Good stuff. I've reached a point where I am losing so much in a day, I do not care anymore and end up taking a massive loss. What can I do to learn to walk away? We really already talked about it, right? Like you got to be able to recognize well before you get to that point. Because once you get to that point, there's not much you can do. We, I can't, you know, unless I'm there to tackle you, right? <laughs> There's just not much that, that can be done, right? Your emotions are, have, are too far gone. You don't have the ability to, to, to correct it, right? What you have to do is establish firm control three to four steps before you get to that point. Um, you got to learn to walk away early. And I would actually suggest that you just practice doing that. And yes, it's definitely going to limit your opportunity in the short term. But the more that you establish that control, then you can start to kind of build some, um, some increase in competency. You'll have a little bit more kind of leeway and rope to, to let yourself go a little farther because you'll be able to stop it. 
And, and the way that I would look at this is actually like an injured athlete who's in, in rehab. Okay. Right. You getting to this point is the same as a, as an athlete, like severely spraining their ankle, right? There's not much you can do to keep performing them. What you have to do is build up the strength in a rehab situation. And again, I'm not saying go to the sim. I'm saying rehab it, you know, at let's say levels one to four, you're, excuse me, you're fine and able to walk away, but you get to level five. Now you're teetering. You get to level six, you're fucked. Okay. So that means consistently stopping trading, take a break. Then I'm not saying you have to stop for the entire day. Give yourself 15, 20 minutes to reset, you know, do some writing to get the, get your emotions out. Maybe go for a walk, uh, get some food. Um, you know, there's lots of things you can kind of do to, to disrupt the pattern, but do it before the problem gets big. And then you can build up the strength. This is like the rehabilitation process, right? Where you're building up the strength to, to fix the injury. And then as over time, you'll be able to start to give yourself more of, more of a chance to get to level five and six because there won't be as much risk. Jared, do you recommend setting a daily profit goal and quitting when it gets reached, uh, gets reached or what about a daily stop loss? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's an element of this that's more tactical and not my domain, so JJ can hop in. Uh, but there's an element of this that it really just depends. I mean, wh what are your goals? Uh, how, how emotionally compromised do you get at certain points, right? So there are times like like what I kind of just mentioned where, yeah, um, setting a profit goal is good if you're looking to, um, you know, build up confidence, right? And and if, if your confidence is kind of teetering at times, then yeah, set that goal, hit it, and, and walk away. But as a long-term strategy, hell no, right? You are significantly limiting your upside um, if, if, you're, um, if you're setting a, a profit goal daily because there might be a lot more opportunity in the market. You're, you may not be sizing as big. I mean, you're significantly limiting yourself. So no, it's not a long-term solution. I would use it as a Band-Aid in the short term to help you deal with whatever emotions are present. Interesting, yeah, because a, a lot of people, I, it, especially when I first transitioned to trading, Jared, it, it, a lot of people... Uh, almost like recommend this or like champion this idea. And I, you know, as poker players, we're always thinking uh, it's not about, um, uh, that's just yeah. not a thing in poker, right? Like I grind out as many hands as I can when I'm playing my A game, right? Or like I, I when the game's good, I don't want to leave the game. So a lot of this never really made sense to me. Um, the, thing, the thing is, you know, when your game is good, a lot of new traders think that their game is good and they blow all their profits. Yeah. Right, because they don't know what they're doing just yet. See, but when you're pressing it, you you're actually in the zone. You know that, like you you actually you know you know what you're doing, right? So I think you have to come to that point where you're consistent, and then you can do that. Otherwise, you you got to have some sort of checks and balances for your ego, because a, a lot of traders who start out they're having a good day, then they start pressing it and taking just ridiculous trades and, and it goes the other way. We see it all the time, right? Um, so maybe once you know what you're doing, then then right. progress to the, the level where Ray was doing in poker, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, like Jerry said, it's, this is more of a technical thing. If you have an edge, yeah, you know, then why would you leave the computer? Exactly. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's that's a perfect example of why I typically don't work with beginners <laughs> to even think about that. So that's a that's great right. advice. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's see. Uh, is making probes small trades to get a feeling of how the market is moving a good strategy? I don't know if this is your domain. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's not my... Okay, why does losing money affect us so emotionally? I mean, like I mentioned before, right? There's so much on the line, right? And so when you're struggling with, with, with losing, whether it's a hatred of it, whether it's a fear of it, you got to understand what's on the line. So again, it's, it's your goals. Um, it's your confidence. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, perhaps your livelihood and your ability to kind of financially afford, uh, whatever lifestyle either you want or you have, you got to take some time to actually write those things out, uh, because that's, what's, what's on the line. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, this sort of prospect theory thing, right? Where we're losing typically hurts more, uh, than winning feels good. Now, the thing about prospect theory is that that's not a fundamental law of human nature, right? Uh, we have to kind of understand why it is that losing hurts more for us individually. And for some traders, you know, that's a consequence of expectations, right? They expect to win. They don't expect to lose. And so as a, as a byproduct of that expectation over time, we build up more disdain and hatred towards it. Uh, and, and, you know, that can be corrected, not by expecting to lose. I'm not saying 
that that's, that's really the goal. Um, but, but actually when we're dealing with expectations, you have to understand that expectation imply a guarantee. Right? You may not necessarily think about that logically, but that's, that's the, the inherent kind of what, what's, in, what's implicitly embedded in that um, expectation is that you're guaranteeing what it is that you uh, are expecting. So the reality is you can only expect your worst, right? You can only, you know, ex expect yourself to be at your worst because that's the only thing you can guarantee. It doesn't require any energy. You can be as emotionally compromised as you want. Your worst is, is what's easy to show up. Everything else you've got to earn. And I know that sounds pathetic. And I know it's, it's not, not like the most aspirational way to think, okay, but it's real. So what that does though, is it helps to recalibrate that when you actually, you know, are, are, you know, profiting from trades, when your execution is really strong, you deserve to feel good for that, right? I'm not saying like go fist pump and celebrate, but yeah, you can feel proportionally good for, for having had all of the work and effort you put in, you know, to be uh, validated in some way. Um, so yeah, we're trying to start to balance out, you know, the, the good things, the good, uh, good vibes that can come from, from profiting. And we're trying to round out the downside of, of uh, how losing can, can affect us. All right. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit here, uh, Jared, cause I got some other questions that uh, I don't think were sent to you just cause I know we were running out of time here. Yep. Um, I always feel I have to break even or positive for the day or I feel lousy. I'm sure there is a deeper issue here. How do I correct this problem? As I know, I should not be results oriented, but I cannot shake this. The A to C game analysis is the easiest way to begin shifting your mentality out of that results oriented uh, mind, right? right? Again, we need feedback. And if you're basing feedback um, purely off of results, uh, it's just biased in the short term. And, and if you are feeling like you have to break, e break even or be positive for the day, or you feel lousy, it's 100% a confidence issue. So it's not just the A to C game analysis that's going to help you got to work through the confidence chapter in the book and really get to the underlying piece of it. Uh, and I, I, I can tell you that, you know, there's a lot of material here. This book is 310 pages compared to my poker book, which was uh, about 215. The bulk of the book has a shit ton of content. I, you know, it's, it's very likely that you will find some things that will help to explain the weaknesses and confidence. And, and just while we're on the subject, when we, when I talk about weaknesses and confidence, I'm not saying that you're weak as a person. I'm saying that weakness and confidence is just expressing some flaw that exists in how you are perceiving your skill. Okay. Confidence is an emotion. It's not something solid or tangible. Your skill, your competence is what's solid. Confidence is just the perception that you have about your skill. And it could be excessive in terms of you thinking you're better than you are. And it can be, you know, in this case, worse, right? Thinking that you're worse than you actually are. Right. And, and there's always going to be some inaccuracies because it's, it's, it's impossible to perfectly know exactly what your skill is at any given point, right? What we look at is track record over time. Um, but the point is that when we're working on these weaknesses and confidence, we're just trying to isolate how our perception of our own skill is altered in ways that uh, cause problems in either direction. Jared, is there a way to differentiate a situ a a biological or a physiological stressor of minor magnitude and sensible versus a lack of preparation when it comes to an otherwise successful strategy? Yes. Um, but I think we've got to look reasonably. I mean, if we're talking about trading, right, the biological stressor is going to be closer to like you being able to support yourself and feed yourself, right? Basic biological needs, mm -hmm. you know, you go beyond that, uh, everything is going to be performance based. Um, now there may be some personal problems that emerge from this, right? And, and that stuff can come out, um, but you know nobody's going to kill you. Right? There's not, you know, your, your computer is not going to like, you know, short circuit and you know, and then you go with it. So, <laughs> so what are we, what are we really talking about, right? We're talking about misperceptions of of what's going on, and those misperceptions are a byproduct of these performance flaws that fundamentally alter how we're perceiving the situation or perceiving ourselves or perceiving the market and how our strategy interacts with it. So yeah, basically summary is uh, the odds are it's not biological. Mm -hmm. Is it good to have a coach or an accountability partner from a non-trading background uh, who we can be honest with about our thoughts and feelings um, not counting parents, friends, uh, what are your thoughts on this? 
I mean, if it depends on the skill of that person. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, there's not a lot of competency in the sports psychology space. You know, if we take like an average, the average is poor. So, you know, yes, there's a lot of good people out there. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I, and my point in even saying this is that what is this accountability partner even doing for you? Okay. If they're giving you advice, fuck no. Okay. Cause that's not what you need from somebody random trying to give you advice on what you need. No. If you want somebody who's going to be accountable to help you work through, you know, material in the book or material for yourself in terms of, you know, asking these questions, probing you to figure out what's going on in those moments. And they just are like doing dictation and it becomes, you know, kind of like this sparring session where you're just like, it's just easier for you to think and talk out loud. Cause frankly, I'm like that. I mean, I, I had a writing partner cause I couldn't just sit down and write all, all this stuff. I needed to actually talk. It was just easier for me to do that. So if that's what this person is, is kind of a sounding board and they're helping you kind of take notes or you're taking notes as you talk and helping you figure out what's, what is going on hundred percent. That, that, that sounds fantastic. And you guys can kind of pair up and find people you can do that with. I absolutely recommend that. But if that person starts to tell you like, Oh man, you know, uh, here's what you really need to be thinking in this situation run. Okay. Cause, cause I'm telling you this stuff is complicated. Uh, I mean, the book again, tries to make it very simple uh, and kind of lay it out in orderly fashion, but it's still going to be a challenge for you guys. Like it's going to take work. I mean, even when I'm working with clients, it's challenging, right? This shit is not easy. It's not insurmountable. Okay. But I also don't want you to be deluded into thinking that you can just find simple advice and solve this stuff easily. That, that does not exist for complicated problems. And the stuff that's reoccurring for you guys, the, the, the stuff is more complicated than you think. Simple problems are solved easily. There's not the kinds of stuff that I deal with. Okay? Uh, I'm dealing with the, the, the more challenging stuff and, and that is not going to be helped by you know, some random person. Jared, that's, that's been an hour. Man, uh, I appreciate it, man. I, I appreciate your direct style. I think a lot of people that talk about these subjects can uh, add some fluff into it. Uh, just really appreciate it, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I think uh, I think coming from an athletic background um, helps in that regard because I always liked coaches who just said it what it is. You know, truth is is what kind of makes things easier to learn from. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of the esoteric bullshit. Um, you, want, <laughs> you want you want just like things that just make sense. And again, I'll say it lastly: there's a lot of good advice out there, but what it's lacking is the system, the book lays out the system you can take advice from lots of different sources and work it through the system and it, it, it will work i'm not saying that i have all the answers in the book i'm just saying that i got the system and the system is what will actually solve this stuff then you can use my advice you can use other advice that's that's up to you okay you're the you're the owner of that but but you got to learn how to fish you got to learn how to solve these problems because the biggest problem right as i said at the outset and as i said um, you know, from reading your questions is, is not that you have these problems. It's how you're thinking about them. That's the biggest problem. If you change your perspective on this, everything gets easier from there. Yeah. I love it. It's, it's just like us can, you know, devising trading strategies, Jared, we have, we have a system in place and we need that same, uh, for our mental, for our thinking, for our process. Yeah, Jared, exactly. We're getting the book. Um, Everyone go out there, support it. If you don't think you can learn nothing from this, there's no hope for you. Just quit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insight with us. We really appreciate it. You got it, JJ. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. And Jared, if, if, if you would, uh, if you would like, man, we'd love to have you on the podcast eventually down the road, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Happy to. Great stuff, man. All right. Oh, Jared, have a good one. You too, guys. All right. Be well. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. Go out there and get his book. Uh, like I said, if you, if you don't think you can learn nothing from him, I, you know, just, just quit the room right now. Um, <laughs> good luck to you. <laughs> much, much love. Everybody. Then, then there's no pleasing you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No pleasing you. Yeah. There's no pleasing you. <laughs> uh, much love everybody. Be, be safe. We'll see you in the morning. Maybe I'll see you tonight in the crypto streets. <laughs>